recording has started. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to BC 110 course on identity in Christ. So last week, we covered on being free in Christ or having liberty in Christ. So this week, we will still continue on the same topic. And we will look on to the other aspects, like how we are free from the meaningless rituals or free from man-made ideas and how to stand firm in our freedom. And as we stand firm in our freedom, how we should not misuse our freedom that we have in Christ. And as we have this freedom in Christ, through this freedom, how we can honor people, how we can honor the government authorities that God has placed us in. And as we are using this liberty or as we are uh, uh, experiencing this freedom or living out this freedom, how to live this freedom wisely, you know, uh, in Christ likeness. So that we are going to see in today's class. So as we uh, uh, before we could get into this class, can I request one of your uh, one of us to please uh, start this class with a word of prayer? Lord, I thank you for this day, and um, thank you, Lord, that we are going to start this class of um, identity in Christ. And Lord, I pray that you would. Um, Help us, Lord, to realize that um, what you have said about us is who we are and to believe and to accept that in our hearts and to live out to it, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for um, helping um, Pastor Diana to um, teach this um, uh, subject to us and that um, it would get across our minds and that it would come to our hearts and that we would. Um, Thank you, Jesus, for everything. Amen. 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 Thank you, Rin. Thank you. Thank you, each one, for joining in. And let's look into today's class. So we can begin the class by reading Galatians chapter 4, verse 6 to 11. Galatians chapter 4, verse 6 to 11. We are uh, on our notes. We are on page 75. Hi, Krisha. Good morning. Yeah. Can we turn to page 75? Okay. So Galatians chapter 4, verse 6 to 11. Can I request one of you all to please read? Galatians chapter 4, 6 to 11. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son, and you shall serve them and hear of God through Christ. But then, indeed, when you did not know God, you served those which by nature are not gods. But now, after you have known God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage? You observe days and months and seasons and years. I'm afraid for you, lest I have labored for you in vain. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sri Radha. So what we see in Galatians chapter 4 is, because we are sons of God, now we have the liberty, we have the freedom to call our Father, Abba Father. So it says that we are no more slaves. We are no more in the bondage that we used to be before in Christ. The minute we receive Jesus as a Lord and Savior. So in Christ, we have got this new relation that is the sonship relationship with God, where we have become the son of God through Christ. And now we have become the heir of God through Christ. So when we have, when we have become uh, the child of God, or when we get into this new relationship of uh, being son of God, everything changes. 
everything changes so we don't have to get back into a weaker mentality or into get back into those beggarly elements is what Paul is saying we don't have to get back don't have this kind of desire even to get back into any kind of bondage the freedom that we have in Christ is to come to God the Father with a, with a sense of liberty, with this new relationship. So let's not get ourselves entangled with any kind of religion. Because we don't belong to a kind of religion or set of group where we uh, get into some uh, man-made ideas or uh, man-made rituals. But then we belong to God. We belong to God. We have this freedom to come into the presence of God and you know worship Him in freedom. We have uh, the freedom to call uh, God Abba Father. So we need to know the freedom that we have and we need to realize that so that we can live in that freedom in Christ Jesus. So very important it is for us to renew our mind so that we can be free from every man-made ideas. Time and again, there would be new rituals, new ideas been brought in by the religious leaders. But then we, being in Christ, being in the Lord, should recognize, should be able to know that, you know, what is from God and what is man-made rituals so that we can stay out of it. So that we don't give in to any kind of cultural superstitions uh, that is around us. So what is more important is, as stated in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, it's, it's asking us to stand firm in the freedom that God has given us. It says, Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, it says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. So we can take it as a warning and we can also take it as a firm uh, a saying for us to stand firm in the freedom by which Christ has given us so that we don't get back or get ourselves entangled in any kind of yoke or so being, uh, has been said that we also should know the freedom that we have. In Galatians 15, verse 13 to 14, okay, or um, I think we, as we covered verse 1, Galatians 5, verse 1, I think we can do a study. Just please. Galatians chapter 5, verse 13 to 14. I'll read it. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Very, very important. Paul is saying to the church in Galatians that, brethren, you have been called to liberty. Only do not use the liberty, the freedom, as an opportunity for the flesh, to give in to the flesh. So what is Paul saying here? Paul is saying he's having this great fear uh, of the legalist is that the freedom will be used as an opportunity for the flesh to give in to our fleshy desires. So the idea is that people will just go out and sin as they please. Then say to God that I'm sorry, please forgive me. And then go on doing what they desire, what they want to do. So Paul is recognizing the danger of this very attitude. 
So he is warning the people of Galatians against it. So is it only for the people of Galatians or is it apt even for our day? Sometimes we take the grace, God's grace, for granted. So grace is not a license for us to sin. But then grace is given to us for us to prune us, for us to walk away from the old nature, but walk in the newness of life in Christ, or walk in the freedom of God's grace. So that's the idea that Paul is saying, um, you know, he writes, uh, saying, brethren, saying, brothers, these are those who are all sons of God. So he's addressing them. You're all the children of God who through faith you're in Christ. He also says in Galatians 3.26 that these are those who were baptized in Christ and have put on the Christ nature on them. So the one who's going astray or one who's trying to do the things according to their flesh are the ones who are already in Christ. So your Paul is warning them. He's saying, listen, the grace that God has given you, the freedom that God has given each of us is to do the things pleases God, or to walk in the freedom that is pleasing God. It is not for us to uh, fulfill the desire of our flesh and get back to God saying, sorry, please forgive me, Lord, and repeat what it is. So he's saying it is danger. This attitude is danger. So Paul is warning the people not to get into this kind of attitude or this kind of manner of life, but he is encouraging us to live the freedom, freedom in Christ that pleases Christ. Later he says, these one have been called to liberty. So we see that uh, Paul puts it early in the chapter that they have been made free by Christ Jesus. So now, these people is encouraging you and me, or encouraging us to stand fast, stand in the liberty, stand in the freedom of which Christ has made us free. So this is what we read in Galatians chapter 1, right? That therefore, the liberty by which Christ has made us free. So we have not become free by ourselves, but Christ has set us free. So this freedom, there is a condition that we will not get back to our old nature, old life, but we will do the things that pleases God so that we have been set free and we do the things that pleases God. So we can also check, put a check over ourselves and ask, how am I using this freedom that I have in Christ? So when we ask such question to ourselves, it will make us to think or look back into our life and have a check over our life. Am I doing the things that pleases God? Am I doing the things that is uh, truly the freedom that we have in Christ? So that we do not use the liberty as an opportunity for the flesh. Clearly, uh, uh, it says for uh, the scripture, the Paul is asking, Apostle Paul is asking us, choose the liberty, choose the freedom that is in Christ. And let's not choose the freedom to take opportunity to fulfill our desire of the flesh because that is a very dangerous attitude and that is not the right attitude in Christ. Okay, and here uh, also Paul is asking us to uh, think the right thing in Christ. Our thinking needs to be changed. It needs to be pleasing God. It me uh, every area, every action should be pleasing Christ. So that is uh, that. That is how that we can renew our mind to think the right things in Christ. So with that, we will move on to the next verse, uh, next verse, which talks about, for all the law is fulfilled. So what is it Paul is mentioning here? Paul is asking us, we need to treat each other with love. 
I'm just reading that verse again. A minute. Okay. Verse 14, chapter 5, verse 14 in the book of Galatians, it says, For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So Paul is again bringing us to what Jesus had commanded. He's asking us to fulfill this law. So what is it? So there's an attitude of service towards one another, which in turn can fulfill the great commandment. What was the great commandment that Jesus had given us? That you shall love your neighbor as your self. So this is what Paul is emphasizing each of us on, so that it can keep us from destroying ourselves. How can, if you don't keep this, how it can destroy ourselves? We may think that there is a question. Yes, Sri Radha? I see your hand been raised. Sri Radha, your hand is raised. Do you like to share something? What freedom do we have that is different from the world? Okay, Rin is asking, okay, what freedom do we have that is different from the world? Anyone in the class would like to answer Rin on this question? Anyone? Surya, Sean? Nina, yes, Surya, please, you can unmute and answer this question. Uh, Ma'am, in Jesus Christ, uh, we are having the true freedom. Uh, the word is uh, no, no. In, in Christ, we have the true freedom. So Rin question is, how is that freedom different from the world? So she wants to understand the freedom of the world for her to understand the freedom in Christ. So is there anyone who can explain that? What is the freedom that you have in the world that is different from the freedom that we have in Christ? Krisha? Anyone? Uh, yes, Pastor. Yes. Um, I believe like by knowing the truth uh, in spirit and knowing the truth of Christ that he actually did uh, like, you know, died for us on the cross and resurrected. So that freedom it itself uh, is a freedom which is beyond this world because we know the truth and we know where we are heading and where we are going towards the salvation and looking forward to live with God. So that freedom is... Uh, 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 we can't measure it. It's it's uncomparable. We can't compare it with the freedom of the world. That's what I believe. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Krisha. Anyone, Nina, would you like to add to it? Add to what Krisha and Surya said? Yeah, okay. it's freedom it's a... from the... Yeah, sorry. Yeah, somebody please, else please go ahead. raise their hand. They no, can we can ahead. read. No, no, please yeah. go ahead, Nina. I just thought yeah. I'd read it. Yeah, I said it's it's freedom from the bondage of sin, which is where we were when we were in the world. But in Christ, we have been set free from that kind of a bondage. So then uh, we are free to live in the way that he wants us to live and how the Spirit leads us to live. So in that way, it's totally different. Uh, the kind of freedom which the world offers is to live after after the flesh, to do exactly what the flesh wants you to do. But here we are free from the bondage of sin, which is so enslaving and people cannot get out of that bondage of sin by themselves. It is never possible. But Christ has set us free in that way. And so we have the freedom to live in his, in, to walk in his ways, to live in that way. So that is really true freedom, which he has given us. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. So, Rin, what is your intake on saying freedom from the world? So, what is that area that you look in that you uh, that you say that 
this can be considered the freedom in Christ or how is it? What is the freedom that you're longing that is from the world that may be a challenge for you to give up or give away? Is there any freedom like that? So that you know, others can share their views. I see Sean has raised his hand, and Prince also has uh, shared some comments saying that the freedom of not being influenced and controlled by the world, right? Freedom from sin, bondage, and fear. Prabhu has shared, yes, you're right. So, uh, Rin, if you can share with us, is there any freedom of the world that you are struggling with and you feel like it is right to have? For me, it's like um, um, like um, to pursue my ambition or to fulfill it. I mean, it's like um, I mean, we have the freedom or the choice to do it, but like um. God is like um, calling me to um, for a greater call. So it's kind of like I have to give up that right to um, to be submissive to him. And uh, it's hard, especially when um, people are looking up to you and they are expecting something else. And um, yeah. Thanks, Rin. Sean, would you like to share something that would help Rin in this phase? Um, when you're with uh, when you're with God, when you have freedom through Christ, I just like to refer to uh, Ecclesiastes chapter three, verse uh, fourteen, where uh, they talk about. Uh, he says, "I know that everything God does will last." forever you can't add anything to it or take anything away from it and one thing god does is to make us stand in awe of him so as you can see here you know uh, when god gives us freedom it's uh it, it's it is true freedom it's not it's uh it's nothing like the world gives when even the burden that god gives is as light as yoke compared to what the, the burden which we get from the world so I think that's the difference when you have, it, when you have freedom to Christ and you have freedom to uh, freedom in the world. Thank you, thank you, Sean. Thank you so much for adding that. Yes. So all of us know that there is a call, there's a purpose in your life. So to pursue that call, pursue that purpose, there is something called discipline. We need to discipline ourselves in our life so that. We are more focused on what God is calling us to do. So when there is a call, there will definitely be certain disturbance from the world that may distract us to, uh, you know, from pursuing what God wanted us to do. So that is when the struggle comes. The minute we know we are getting distracted, this does not please God. So we need to discipline ourselves to let go of certain things. So that is what Sean was sharing. The yoke that God has placed, the burden that God has placed on the heart is not heavy or it's not too much. He will always allow certain things in our life that which we can handle. And also God says that I will give you the grace and I will be with you. So we are not alone. He is with us and he is leading us. So in this um, in, the, in this call of fulfilling what God has called each one of us, in this journey, each of us are not alone because God Himself is with us and leading us. So, in the process, we do get enticed towards many distractions because of the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. But then at the same time, God has given His word, His promise to help us not get deviated with these distractions, but then keep ourselves disciplined and set our focus on what God has called us. OK, so that is where the challenge lies, like what Rin was sharing, uh, like the freedom. 
what is the freedom that is different? Yes, the freedom of the world is much different than the freedom that we have in Christ. Freedom of the world takes us away from God. It, uh, it destroys the joy, peace, the love of God that is in us. But the freedom in Christ restores all these things, the joy, peace, love. And it also helps us to be more focused on what God wants us to do in this life. It gives a purpose for our life. And, and also, uh, the freedom of the world is nothing but to kill, steal, and destroy us. But then when we have the freedom in, in Christ, is nothing but the restoration renewing of our mind, restoration and Christ sets us up to do what God has called each one of us to do. So Rin, did that answer your question? Did that help you in any way? Yes, Pastor, thank you. Okay, okay. Okay, so here we are in continuation of uh, uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 13 and 14. So in verse 14, we see that for the law is fulfilled. For the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So what is that Paul is asking us? He's asking us to have this attitude of service towards one another. Why? To in turn fulfill the great command which Jesus had given. The great commandment was, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So what happens? We will be mindful to remember the commandment that Jesus had given us. If we get into this freedom uh, of the world, what happens? We will tend to lose this commandment. We will tend not to follow this commandment because the world does not teach us to love your neighbor as yourself, but then it teaches us pay evil for evil, isn't it? So what happens if we follow the freedom that we have in the world? It keeps us, it destroys us, the strife, enmity, many other things, jealousy, envy enters into us. So what happens if these things enter into us? These things enter into us. These things have come in only to kill, steal, and destroy. But whereas the freedom in Christ will enable us to fulfill the commandment that Jesus has given. Why? The Christ in us, the Spirit of the Lord who is in us, will enable us to love the neighbor as yourself. Now, the neighbor may not be a very pleasant person that you can, you know, love him for all that he's been doing. What if he's a very unpleasant neighbor every time picking on you? But here, because you are in Christ and you have this freedom in Christ, doesn't matter what your neighbor is doing, but you will still pray for him and act in love with him. Not because of his action, but because of Christ's love that you will continue to love him. And you will keep away from every kind of strife, envy, jealousy, or every kind of, you know, the enmity or the words that he spoke or to disturb, to allow into yourself that may disturb your peace. But then you will choose, Lord, I'm forgiving this person for your sake. I'm not going to allow any kind of his action or his words bother me. Instead, I will pray for them. I'll pray that he will come into the realization of Christ. I pray that he will be filled with the love of Christ so that he may be at peace. So this is what Paul is talking about. This is the kind of attitude that Paul is talking for us to build within us, to carry the attitude in a way that pleases God so that we can keep the law that Christ has given us, that love your neighbor as yourself, and so that we can fulfill the law in one word. So we don't need any kind of book of in instructions to teach us how to love our neighbor, isn't it? Because God has put this conscience within us. He has given us the wisdom how to handle ourselves. So all we have to do is to look into our own heart and it will tell us how we ought to love our neighbor as ourselves. So how? 
we need to learn the scriptures. We need to make sure that the word of God is in our heart and in our mind. So the word of God is more powerful than the word is in your book or Bible. The word is more powerful when the word is stored in your heart and in your mind. That's why we encourage our students during this course to memorize the scriptures. When we memorize and understand the revelation of the word, the word becomes one with us. So in time, the spirit of the Lord who's living inside us will remind us. He will speak to us through the word. Why? So that the word can set us free. The word can help us to walk in that liberty. The word can help us to walk in the wisdom of God. So Jesus, who is the wisdom of God, have, is indwelling within us. So when we have the word within us, in the right season, in the right time, the Spirit of the Lord will remind us with the word, because the word has the power to set us free. Set us free from every bondage that may trouble us in that season. So the word is very important. To be, uh, to be stored in our heart and in our mind. That's what in Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, he says, meditate on the word day and night, so that in the right time it may be a blessing. It can give you a success in the right time. So when we have this word in us, we can experience and walk in the freedom so that we don't get ourselves into any trouble. So in the New Testament, it teaches us to walk in the Spirit and to walk in love. Last class, we discussed more on that, like how to walk in Spirit and walk in love. So we see in the scripture that walking in love toward others, it can override over walking in freedom. So what is important? We are talking more about the freedom, isn't it? More about our freedom. So when we say freedom, we, we, we have the sense like, I it's my right. It's my right. I have this freedom. I can do this. But then that is not the freedom that we talk about, the freedom in Christ, or freedom uh, is to walk in spirit and to walk in love. So what is that? Walk in love or walk in the freedom of love is with this quote, love yourself, love your neighbor as yourself, okay? What does the scripture teach us about this freedom? Keeping the other person on priority. Being considerate about another person. Think, putting the other person first or putting ourselves into other person's shoe and thinking, or being more understanding the other person than expecting the other person to understand us. So it is very important. So what happens when we love our neighbor as ourself, our freedom ends. Why? Where the love towards another person begins. <clears throat> I'll repeat, our freedom ends where love towards another person begins. We see in the scripture that walking in honor towards others overrides our walking in freedom. This is what the scripture is teaching us. Walking in love towards others overrides over walking in freedom. So if you are walking in honor towards others, it overrides our, walk, our walking in freedom. So our freedom ends when love, honor towards others begins. So we are completely free in our spirit. So we are letting go of the freedom that we could otherwise enjoy for the benefit of another person. Is not That's not a problem at all. For Christ's sake, I do this. Is there any illustration that I could get from the class that where 
your act of love ended with your freedom where you put others first and you know you sacrifice certain things for the love for the act of love anyone from the class if there's something that you have done certain things anyone from the class Anyone? Sean, Surya, Krisha? Yes, Sean, go ahead. Uh, Ma'am, I think um, at, uh, I think it's mostly between the festival times. You know, my, most of my friends aren't, uh, you know, Christians, so they come and like wish me like a happy Ugari and happy, you know, uh, wish me uh, like very other day festivals. So at that time, I say that I'm sorry. So at that time, I feel like, um, you know, I, I'm, um, I'm I'm sacrificing for uh, I'm sacrificing in that way, you know. I before maybe I used to like take it. I said like okay and all that, but now I learned that I should say like no. no I'm sorry. I I don't uh, please you know don't uh, you know wish me rather. So but they feel bad at that time. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Sean. Is there anyone? The question is. Prince, I see that you're asking me to repeat the question. The question is, is there any way that you are sacrificing your freedom for the love of your neighbor? See, we are talking about freedom, right? Walk in freedom, walk in the spirit, walk in love, walk in freedom. So how do we walk in love? So when we walk in love, our freedom ends. So is there any illustration that uh, happened in your life that for the sake of your neighbor that you have uh, sacrificed your freedom? One example it can be, like we are traveling with all our friends uh, to a different place and we are traveling in a train where we have others also in the same, in the same compartment. So just because we are group of friends we are so excited that we don't want to sleep at 10. we want to sing we want to play games definitely there would be a noise around and that may disturb the others elderly or the other business people who are also travel in the same compartment so we make a choice we make a choice saying that hey we should be considerate of the other person. I think for the sake of others, we need to rest. We are giving up on our joy in our freedom. There's nothing wrong. You're talking, you're discussing, or you're having a time together. That's nice. But then you're sacrificing that time because you're considering the other person's important. One is that. Or you're having a, a hard time with your neighbor. Your neighbor is not concentrated. He's playing loud music day and night. And here you need to pray, you need to work, you need to have peace in your home. But then, if you go out and tell something, the person may not be in the right position to hear you. So you'll be a little considerate, you'll be a little understanding. And OK, this is their festival. This is their time for a day or two. They're going to, you know, uh, you know, uh, play loud music. So I will understand and I'll keep quiet. I'll try to adjust myself. So your freedom ends there to have peace with your neighbor. It can be anything. So is there anyone who'd like to share any example? Yes. I have one. So, yes. um, I mean, I um, we had me and um, one of my friends. We had a misunderstanding with each other, and um, so um, 
we kept some distance from each other and um, later I realized like God wants me to make wrong things right or go and talk it out to that person. So um, I went and approached myself even though I thought I was right. But um, I approached that person and we talked it out and um, and then after we talked like there was so much peace in my heart and uh, the person was understood and um, yeah so we came back again together. Wow, that's wonderful, Rin. Thank you so much for sharing. Yes, yes. By you know, instead of waiting for the other person to come and say sorry or try to get things, I think our freedom ends. They see you put yourself stop and you step out to do something for the sake of Christ. I have the love of Christ, so I need to do it. Let me not wait. The minute you do it in obedience or in submission to Christ, you see God honors that step. He honors the very attitude that you took in. And He will definitely bless. He will give you peace that is needed in that relationship or in that friendship. Okay, thank you. With that, we will move on. So we are completely free in our spirit. Okay, so when our freedom hands, uh, where the honor towards another begins. So by this very act, we are completely free in our spirit. Why? Because we are letting go of the freedom, what we would otherwise enjoy for the benefit of another person. So it is absolutely not a problem at all for us to let go things that may please God. So willingly sacrificing a personal freedom for the benefit of another person does not in any way put us in bondage. Why? Because in our spirit, we are indeed free in Christ. Isn't that beautiful, friends? In our spirit, we are free in Christ. Amen? So with that, we will move on to the next. I see we have a few minutes left. I'll try to cover on the uh, point on obeying the civil authority, that is, the government authorities. In Romans chapter 13, verse 1 to 7, we read, Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. This is very strange, isn't it? Or we can only say, Lord, it was only happening in your time, not in our time. Well, let's read further. Verse 2 says, Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. So what as Paul is trying to say in this first two verses, we see that Paul is simply saying that we should be subject or we should be obedient, we should be submissive to the governing authorities. Why do you think? Why do you think? Maybe Paul is saying that because in the time that he lived, down, the governing authorities were very good, that he could be submissive to them, he could submit to them. So he wrote this. Or the time of Jesus, the governing authorities were very good, very pleasant. They were very supportive to Jesus in his ministry. That's the reason Paul is writing this. Nina says, no, they were pagans. Yeah. So what we see here is, it is a contrast. Okay. So in his time, in Paul's time, we see there was a group of zealous Jews. So in that day, he recognized, Paul recognized that these Jews did not submit to the king or to any of the authorities. They believed only God. Okay, so I will not pay any taxes to these Jews. I will only pay tax to God. 
and not to any kind of you know governing authorities so paul is writing this to bring a correction among the jews so we subject ourselves to governing authorities because they are appointed by god and serve a purpose in his plan so in the verse it says no authority except from god so what do we understand here we understand that god appoints a nation's leader but not always to bless the people when we look back the history when we look into the history you see different kings came into reign for a purpose some came to bless people some kings reign judge the people some to ripen the nation for judgment of god so when you look at it you see even our savior jesus suffered under the leadership or under the authority of pontius pilate so one of the worst roman governors like in judea judea had ever had so paul was under the leadership of nero you know what happened during the roman empire time they literally burned people on stake in the marketplace in that uh, colosseum they fed christians uh, to the wild beasts like the lions and others so we see that neither a lot nor his apostles denied or went against these authorities they just prayed for them and they submitted isn't it this is what we see in the scripture and in the history of the apostles so the scripture it says therefore whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of god rin as uh, rin's question here is but it does not look like god appointed all these kings and leaders well the scripture says let every soul be subject to the governing authorities roman 13 verse 1 and 2 for there is no authority except from god and the authorities that exist are appointed by god what does it say the authorities that exist are appointed by god now god appoints the leaders he raises the leaders that's what the scripture says promotion comes from god the kings are reigned by god god appoints the king and he puts him down king saul was appointed by god but how we led depended on him did he please god in his reign depended on his heart attitude how he submitted himself in that reign in that leadership the minute nebuchadnezzar was as a king in the minute he took all the glory he didn't give it to god he took all the glory what happened the very minute god took away his understanding and made him uh, you know without sense he made him to go on the street eat the grass mud dust so god has power to raise a king and to remove him from that position so it is the god who raises the authorities and there is a purpose in that there is a purpose in that and also nida has put a post to the comment we see that we submit to authorities because they are instituted by god yes so therefore see verse 2 says therefore whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of god it's not that you're resisting the authority but you're resisting the ordinance of god and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves So we need to be very careful of that. Since government have authority from God, we are to obey them. Unless, and of course, the order us to do something that is contradiction to God's law, then we are commanded to obey God before man, as per Acts four eight nineteen. Can we turn to Acts four nineteen, please?
But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. So it is very important that we pay attention what each one are instructing us to do. You got it? So when uh, Peter and John were uh, confronted uh, in front of the authorities, they are asking, they are asking the question to the people there, to the leaders there, whether it is a right, the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. You let me. God has asked us to do this, and we are to do this. So the gospel also asks us to walk in wisdom. We need to walk in wisdom from God. So those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. So God uses governing authorities as a check upon and sinful desires and tendencies. And government can be an effective tool in resisting the effect of man's holiness. So with that in idea, like, the scripture, whatever we read, it says that Paul's idea, we see that Apostle Paul's idea is that Christian should be the best citizen of all, even though they are loyal to God, before they are loyal to the state. So we believers or we Christians, the follower of Christ, I would like to say, are a good citizen because we are honest, we give no trouble to the state, to the country, we pay our taxes, and most importantly, we also pray for our state, our city, our state, our country, and especially for the rulers. Why? Because the scripture says we are they are God's ministers. So we also see that Paul, Apostle Paul, describes the government officials as God's minister. They have a ministry in the plan and the administration of God just as much as the church leaders do. So what we must do? We must be subject to the governing authorities, not only because we fear the consequence of our very own act, but because we know it is the right, it is the right thing to do before God. So we honor God. Because we honor God, we pay tax, uh, you know, uh, we respect, we submit, we do the right things, friend of God. Okay, and uh, Romans 13, 7, lastly, it says, render therefore to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, uh, 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 customs to whom customs, and fear to whom fear, honor to whom you honor. So we end with this, like, Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Honor your leaders that you are placed, that God has placed you in. It is not by chance that we have put in, in each place. We need to honor our leaders, our pastors, our ministry leaders, um, whichever place we are in. It is very, very important to honor. Why? Through honors where we will receive our blessings not from the people, but from God. Because the word of God is asking us to honor, give and respect, be submissive. This is what God is expecting us as a child of God that we need to do is by honoring our people, our government, our authorities, our leaders, our pastors. Okay, so with that, I end this session. Okay, Sean, I see your hand raised. Is there anything that you would like to share? Uh, ma'am, my question is uh, regarding the exam, ma'am. Which one will be having first, ma'am? Is it Holy Spirit or ev uh, Lifestyle Evangelism? What is there in your timetable? Uh, one second, Sean, I'll end this class with a word of prayer and we can discuss sure, on this. Okay. Um, oh, dear God, we come into your presence with a heart of thanks and praise. Thank you, Lord, that you have taught us uh, the 
true freedom is to walk in love and walk in spirit. The true freedom is uh, when we consider the other person better than ourselves. The true freedom is to uh, submit and obey the higher authorities, the government authorities. Lord, the true freedom is by honoring people around us. It may be our parents, our elders, our leaders, um, our pastors. Lord, we pray that, Lord, you will help us, help us to submit to submit ourselves to each other in obedience of your word of oh father lord i pray that you will pour out your grace to each of us in our class who may be present now or who may watch the session later we pray that you'll pour out your grace the grace of understanding the grace of submission lord we pray that you will enable this uh, grace within each of us so that we can love our neighbors as ourselves, and we can walk in that grace of love, O oh Father, that uh, we may honor people and respect our leaders around us. Lord, we thank you that you are the most high God, Lord. You desire that we may do things pleasing to you, O oh Father. Lord, we thank you that you will enable, you will strengthen us when we are weak. You will help us to understand the things, those things that we do not understand, O oh Father. Thank you for your enablement thank you for your grace thank you for your strength lord thank you father thank you that you are mindful of each of us lord thank you that you continue to work every day every moment lord thank you that you are teaching us through each and every class lord thank you father that you are ministering to each of us by your word by your spirit by your power thank you lord in Jesus name we pray amen amen thank you so much for joining in today's session god bless thank you hope it was a blessing yes thank you god bless <laughs>